the language, and then okay. I will hand it to the uh, Jerome. Okay. And then Jerome will introduce for you. Yes, okay, sounds good. Yes, let's start. Hello, Minglava. Hello, Minglava. Tenoru Dini, the Jamai, Winitana, the Dinai, Winitana, Pound Bido, General NUG, General D, Winitana, Pound Bido, the CME Bono, Continuing Medical Education, General D, Pibina, and Pata Bido, who the Pintin Network Bido, General Pintica, two good in Network Bido, General Lola, so in Kuzo. เอ่อเจ้าเราเอ่อเลลาเอ่อมาลาเราชื่อตัวไอ้ปนเนาะดีเอ็ดเวมาเจ้าเราอคุดาดีนี่เอ่อ uh, เอ่ออุซีอุซองลุปินนี่เนี่ยโปรเฟสเซอร์เจโรดีโกซีเลยชื่อบาเร่เนาะเราเสียอีอุคมอนเนี่ยชื่อนี่เลยปนเนาะเ
talking um, about uh, no, you are talking specialist. to, to <laughs> surgeon uh, doctors and uh, okay nurses uh, also or students on yes students yes. okay okay yeah. so okay so i'm going to share my presentation i think it's one hour one hour yes um, you can quarter as you want So I, I present myself. I'm Dr. Charles-Edouard Molinier. As uh, Professor Saldegozi uh, told, uh, I'm an ENT physician in the University and Hospital Center of Toulouse. Uh, and we are going to talk about um, minor and more important ENT uh, surgical emergencies. By surgical, I don't necessarily mean uh, in the OR, but uh, also uh, some little emergencies that require a technical gesture. First, we're going to see the um, pharyngo laryngeal emergencies. So I think a very common one, uh, fraught foreign bodies. So I think um, it's a common, uh, uh, common cause of consulting in uh, the emergencies care. Uh, what kind of foreign body can we find in, in fraught? A um, lot of children with toys, pearls, seeds, cones, coins, and button battery. Button battery is a really problem because uh, it's making chemical damage and um, necrosis of the tissues. For adults or uh, older children, you can uh, especially encounter fish and chicken bones. The most frequent sites of a fraught uh, foreign body are the uh, tonsils and the epiglottic vallecula. The removal, it's all in the setup. It is uh, done uh, under microscope, if you have one, for oropharyngeal foreign bodies, um, because it's better. I am an otologist surgeon, so I used to, uh, to use, uh, I'm, I'm used to, to have a microscope, but if you don't have one, it's not a big deal. You can also, of course, just have a headlight and you can use a metal tongue depressor, which is more powerful uh, against the tongue. If it is uh, hypopharyngeal or laryngeal foreign body, uh, you can use a nasofibroscope with operator channel if you have one, uh, or, or also for, of course, laryngoscopy under general anesthesia. Very rarely, um, you may have to do a cervicotomy, but it's just for very deep foreign bodies. The complications of uh, throat foreign bodies uh, are infections. Infections, uh, it's just when the foreign body is left too long for a few days or a few weeks uh, and not taken off very quickly. Um, it could lead also to asphyxia, especially with coins or button battery, for example, uh, in the child. Um, it could be pushed into the lower airways. And if it's the case, uh, you may need a pneumologist intervention. And uh, it could be pushed into the esophagus, what it's not a big deal. Generally, it's swallowed. But for some uh, foreign bodies, for example, button batteries, you may need a gastroenterologist advice uh, and fibroscopy. So it's just some uh, X-rays of uh, foreign bodies. Um, X-rays are very useful for radio opaque foreign bodies. Uh, it could also help us finding a neck emphysema, which is an indirect sign of foreign bodies. And when you have a strong doubt and nasofibroscope is um, normal, X-ray is normal or difficult to interpret, you can uh, use CT scan. Uh, for example, for this patient, it was a needle in the deep cervical spaces, and it needs a cervicotomy to remove it. It's just a little video. Uh, if you have um, nasofibroscope with uh, operator channel, uh, ah, I, I don't know if it's working. Okay, maybe it's not working. Well, it, was, it wasn't a big deal, but it was just to see and to show you that it was possible to go uh, through uh, the nose. And it was, uh, this case was a drug addict that swallowed his uh, buprenorphine treatment with the blister because he was stoned. And it was very easy to take off the foreign body 
with the naso fibroscope uh, and operator channel. So other uh, quite frequent um, emergencies um, are neck trauma. So neck trauma um, could be blunt, could be penetrating, or could be both. It can lead to quick death, uh, generally by suffocation or hemorrhage. So um, the two things you must do is to manage breathing first, sometimes with intubation or tracheotomy when the patient is not stable. And uh, you need to manage bleeding uh, by rapid cervicotomy um, when the patient has, uh, is bleeding a lot. If you have a nasofibroscopy and the patient is uh, stable, uh, it's a good thing to do it. And I don't know if all, ah, okay, this video is working. It is just a, a small nasofibroscopy. You can see um, going through the, the nasal cavity in the cavum, in the rhinopharynx. You're going to, in a few seconds, see uh, every uh, possible uh, transfacing wound or uh, larynx hematoma. Or you can see the baston, the epiglottis, uh, of course, the larynx, uh, the hypopharyngeal space. And you can uh, make the patient do the Valsalva maneuver on your nasofibroscope to better expose uh, the hypopharynx. So nasofibroscope is very useful when available. And if you don't have it and you fear the patient may have um, a transfixing wound, you can also, of course, on the operating uh, room, do a panandoscopy, ENT panandoscopy. When uh, we are talking about cervical trauma with wound, uh, it is very important to perform an exploratory cervicotomy as soon as the wound exits the platysma. Uh, we told the intern that when the platysma is okay, they just can uh, suture it uh, at the uh, emergency room uh, with local anesthesia. But uh, as soon as it exits the platysma, even if the patient looks uh, very stable, uh, you must perform an exploratory um, cervicotomy. You're looking for airways, so uh, a wound in the ralanx or the trachea. You're looking for vascular axis, so jugular veins, internal, external, anterior. Uh, of course, carotid arteries, and common external and internal carotid arteries. The pharynx, the esophagus. And for the esophagus, there is a little uh, trick. Uh, you can put a nasogastric tube before the beginning of the surgery to help you identify the esophagus. Because sometimes it's a little complicated. There is a lot of bleeding. Uh, a lot of edema, and the nasogastric tube can help you uh, find the esophagus. You're looking for uh, any damage on the nerves, uh, cranial pairs, 10th, 11th, 12th uh, cranial pairs, and sometimes cervical plexus for more posterior ones. And most of the time, um, systematically, we perform ENT panandoscopy to be sure that there is no uh, transfixing wound. So think about the nasogastric tube. One, it helps you sometimes find the esophagus during the cervicotomy, uh, during the exploratory, exploratory cervicotomy. But most of the time, the patients cannot eat after a few days for the healing after the surgery. And uh, the nasogastric tube, when it's uh, put in the uh, OR, it's better for the patient. And uh, for extreme cases, you may uh, need a safety tracheotomy to be sure the patient uh, doesn't risk asphyxia after the surgery. Just a few uh, words uh, about escorts fall and bleeding after tonsillectomy. Uh, in the Toulouse University Center, uh, since uh, a few years, I think uh, five to six years, we're performing just uh, most of the time uh, subtotal or partial tonsillectomy. It's a case of partial uh, tonsillectomy, a case of mine. Uh, it reduces a lot the risk of escorts fall, but 
uh, we could find a uh, scorch fault. So I think it's impossible to know what to do when you have this kind of patient. So post tonsillectomy, a scorch fall and bleeding. Uh, most of the time, uh, children, sometimes adults. The context is uh, tonsillectomy surgery within the, twin, the two to three uh, weeks. Most of the time, most of the time, it's uh, seven to ten days after the surgery. The child or the adult presents with uh, coughing up and vomiting, and it's uh, of course vital emergency. Uh, you must uh, perform under general anesthesia uh, an intraoral hemostasis. Um, I think it's better. I prefer absorbable sutures when possible uh, than uh, bipolar coagulation because, uh, on my opinion, bipolar coagulation leads to escorts fall, and uh, it's rare uh, that good absorbable suture and stitches on the, the vessels uh, lead to escorts fall. So it's uh, it's it's better to to do this if it is possible. Very exceptionally, uh, if you have an interventional neuroradiologist, uh, you can do an embolization when intraoral hemostasis is not sufficient, or uh, because I, I, I assume in Myanmar it's the same in France, uh, uh, interventional neuroradiologists are quite rare, uh, you can perform carotid, external carotid ligation, but it's very, very exceptional. Most of the time, intraoral hemostasis is sufficient. And I told you it's a very rare condition uh, in Toulouse um, because we are most we are performing a lot of subtotal tonsillectomy, and subtotal tonsillectomy um, has a tendency, a less tendency of bleeding. I think more less than one percent of our patients need um, second hemostasis because of SCAS4. So it's a big part, uh, tracheotomy. Tracheotomy, I think it's very important uh, part because uh, in my opinion, it's not a very complicated uh, surgical gesture. And every surgeon, not only uh, ENT surgeons, uh, should at least uh, little do a tracheotomy because uh, it's a vital uh, gesture and it could, be, uh, it could save a lot of uh, people sometimes. So a little bit of anatomy first. Um, so it's uh, the anterior cervical region from uh, high to low. We could uh, encounter the mandible lower rim, then the hyoid bone, the thyroid cartilage, which is more, uh, more sensible on, um, on males and on, on women because uh, of, uh, of the angle, more sharp. The cricoid cartilage and between the cricoid cartilage and suprasternal notch, there are the tracheal rings. The length between cricoid cartilage and suprasternal notch is very variable uh, according to subjects. There is patient with very long necks and generally it's really easy to perform a tracheotomy and patients with very, very short necks and uh, for this patient, it could be very challenging. This is a region we call the tracheotomy lozenchi. Um, after the skin and the platysma, you have the upper half of the lozenchi uh, delimited by the sternohyoid muscle and homohyoid muscle. And the uh, lower half of uh, the lo lozenchi which is delimited by the sternocleoid mastoid, sternocleidomastoid muscle and sternothyroid muscle. On the midline, there is no muscles. It's uh, called the, the linea alba. Uh, yeah, there is just the thyroid gland we are going to see, which may be in the way and may be a little problematic. The equipment is very, very simple. You just need the uh, mezzembom, clamp, halstead, retractors, uh, of course, and of course, uh, the tracheotomy tube. Um, you should always, before beginning the surgery, when it's not a vital emergency, but even if it's a vital emergency, check for the balloon before uh, putting the cannula to be sure that the balloon is not porous 
that there are not no uh, hair leakage. The procedure is uh, quite simple, but one very important thing is the posi position of the patient. The patient must be in supine position. And if possible, uh, you um, need to put a shoulder roll beneath his uh, scapulae to improve the exposure of the anterior neck. Sometimes it's not possible because sometimes the patient has a, a cervical vertebrae problems or a very important kyphosis. Uh, and when you can't have this type of position, uh, the trachea is far, far away. It's more complicated. The incision is uh, horizontal. It could be vertical, but uh, for very extreme urgency, um, most of the time, it's better to perform an horizontal incision. It's between the cricoid cartilage and suprasternal notch. That's why uh, it's complicated in patients with short necks. And it's between the edges of sternocleido muscles. Then you're performing a median dissection on the linea alba, which is uh, avascular. So most of the time there is no bleeding. You can use mono or bipolar coterie, but sometimes it's not needed. You just need uh, the mezembum. And you're dissecting in the uh, tracheotomy lozenge. The, uh, the role of the aid is very, very important. The aid uh, as uh, the retractors, because it can uh, charge the trachea on the right, left or on the right side. And when it's done, you're going straight to the uh, vascular axis, so uh, jugular vein and carotid artery, or straight behind the trachea uh, on the esophagus. Most of the time, when you are performing your dissection, you may have to feel with your finger to be sure that the trachea is right uh, under and has not been charged by the aid with the retractors. So in this case, uh, the patient has a very large thyroid isthmus. And when uh, there is a thyroid isthmus on the, on the way, oh, sorry, it's not this video, yes. Um, there is possi two, three possible uh, things to do. Uh, most of the time you can go over or under the thyroid isthmus when it is not very large. But uh, for example, in this case, it was better to uh, perform a transfiction, a coterie, and then put stitches because thyroid gland is very, very bleeding. And it's better to uh, have a good exposure of the trachea when the thyroid dismiss is very, very uh, prominent. Of course, this is a tracheotomy with a patient uh, intubated. Uh, but when it's a vital, vital emergency, you don't have the time to do this. You're going uh, through straight the trachea and you see for the bleeding after. When you are on the trachea, there is different possibility. Uh, the first is a vertical incision. It's just for children and young age children. There is not a specific age uh, at which I can tell you uh, do a vertical or horizontal incision, but for children of a few months, a uh, few years, it's a vertical incision because uh, if you're doing an horizontal incision of the trachea, you could uh, performing a complete transaction of the trachea, which is uh, a big, big problem. Horizontal incision is the most common for older children or adults. There is different possible flap, H flap, and my favorite inverted U flap. Uh, you can use uh, also a hole and uh, with a cartilage removal, but I don't really like this kind of, uh, of um, tracheotomy because usually scarring is much more complicated when you make a cartilage removal. So this is a video 
you expose the trachea, you make an incision generally between the second and third ring. You must be careful uh, on the lateral side because there is a vascular axis of the neck, so uh, jugular, internal jugular vein and carotid arteries. And then you can do the flap. It is a inverted U flap with the scissors. And you can, if you want, uh, make uh, stitches to the lower part of the skin, or you can also uh, use non-absorbable sutures, which is held on the thorax of the patient with some uh, band-aid. Um, it's useful if the patient uh, lost his cannula because he is uh, agitated, for example, it's uh, easier to cannulate the patient again. So this is a trick, for example, to, to make the flap is sticked down and um, facilitates the cannulation. So the cannulation must be soft. Uh, if you uh, uh, if it's too difficult, uh, it's that there is a problem. The balloon must be inflated uh, 20 to 30 centimeters of water, not more, because if uh, the balloon is uh, more inflated, uh, you risk uh, tracheo trachea necrosis. And if you have an anesthetist um, on the side of you, you can ask him uh, the capnography to be certain you're in the trachea and this is not uh, in the deep cervical space uh, outside the trachea. So this is a video showing the cannulation. As I told you, it was uh, um, patient intubated. It's really more comfortable for both a surgeon and anesthetist. So you ask the anesthetist to remove the, the tube, intubation tube, and you put softly the cannula, then you inflate the balloon and you put the uh, inner cannula. And when the patient is uh, in the operating room uh, with a respirator inside you, you can connect it to the respirator and ask the anesthetist if the capnography is telling us that we are in the trachea. Oops, sorry. The skin closure must not uh, be too airtight because there is a small risk of subcutaneous emphysema if the balloon is porous and the patient is coughing. Uh, and you can uh, do uh, with tracheotomy straps to be sure the, the tracheotomy is not going out just after the uh, procedure. I am um, used to do a suture, to do stitches, to, to maintain the cannula just a few days after the surgery, because the first few days after the tracheotomy are uh, the more complicated if the patient uh, um, take his cannulate off. It's sometimes very complicated to find the way to the trachea. For a patient who has a tracheotomy tube since a few weeks or a few months, uh, it's really easy to find the way to the trachea because uh, it's, uh, it's done on the next cervical space. So this is the way we are maintaining the cannula. Some uh, special cases, uh, tracheotomy could be done under local anesthesia, uh, of course. Uh, sometimes it's uh, mandatory because the patient uh, has a very large ENT cancer, for example, uh, or the patient has a very uh, heavy uh, facial trauma. I know Professor Lowers uh, made a lesson about uh, the facial trauma. So in this case, just local anesthesia is possible. The patient cannot be intubated. Uh, it's the same procedure, but uh, with lidocaine for the neck, and lay the into the trachea for tracheal anesthesia of the, the mucosa. 
some cases uh, could lead to very difficult tracheotomy, for example, uh, obesity, short necks, I told you, neck uh, vascular abnormalities, uh, when cervical extension is not possible, for example, after um, neurosurgery of the rachis of the, of the spine, cervical spine. And this is some cases of mine of a uh, little complicated tracheotomy. Uh, on the left side, you have uh, Hunter's syndrome, mucoporisaccharidosis, with a very, very short neck and very, very uh, stiff uh, and thick uh, trachea. And it was a, a patient that cannot be uh, intubated. And we performed this tracheotomy, I remember, uh, in, the, uh, in the emergency with Professor Lowers, both of us. On the right side, you have uh, on the upper um, picture a very obese patient. And you can um, imagine it is complicated to do a tracheotomy on uh, such an obese patient. And on the lower picture, you have a patient with a major kyphosis. You can see that the cervical spine uh, is uh, almost perpendicular to the airways. Now we're going to see some uh, facial and cervical infections. There is a lot of them. So we're going to, to see a lot of uh, different cervical and facial infections. So the first one, uh, very common, is peritonsillar and parapharyngeal abscess. Peritonsillar uh, abscess, um, generally it begins with an angina. Uh, and the patient um, goes with trismus edema of the uvula and most of all a bulging of the anterior pillar of the veil. Uh, it's a lot of the time unilateral. Um, sometimes you could encounter a periton a bilateral peritonsillar abscess, but it's very rare. The management is quite simple. Uh, you just need to uh, put some local anesthesiac and uh, to, to put painkillers to the patients because sometimes the trismus is just because of the pain. And then with a metal tongue depressor, you expose uh, the oropharynx and you do first a needle aspiration until you find pus. And when you have pus, you make a little incision and drainage uh, and the patient is healed. Of course, you should also uh, put the patient under uh, antibiotic therapy. Uh, in ENT, it's almost always the same. We, we know just one antibiotic. It's uh, clavulanic acid plus amoxicillin. When the patient is allergic, it's a little more complicated, but most of the time it's uh, amoxicillin and clavulanic acid. You must be careful of uh, aberrant internal carotid. Uh, most of the time, internal carotid is pushed laterally by the abscess, as you can see on the, the pictures, uh, but there may be aberrant carotids. And uh, when there is uh, aberrant carotids, with your needle aspiration, you, you find it. There is a lot of blood and not pus. And of course, in this case, you're not performing incision and drainage. Uh, because if you do so, it could be very complicated for the patient and for you. So that's why you should always do a needle aspiration first before incision and drainage. Parapharyngeal abscess, most of the time it's adult people. Uh, it's also a complication of angina. And in this case, you must watch out for complications, especially respiratory uh, complications. As you can see on the CT scan, there is no space, no lot of space for breathing. Uh, there is also vascular complication, uh, especially internal jugular vein thrombosis. And uh, in very severe cases, uh, mediastinal complication with uh, mediastinitis. The management is under general anesthesia uh, because it's too, uh, too low to, um, to get to the access by oropharyngeal abscess, access. And you can discuss with the uh, anesthetic oral or nasal intubation when the patient has very, very important trismus. In some very severe cases, you can do a tracheotomy under local anesthesia before the drainage. 
Other uh, quite rare abscesses are retropharyngeal, prestelian, and retrostelian abscesses. These abscesses are most common on children, uh, young children, and the children um, present with acute fibrile torticollis. Most of the time, it's a complication of a viral infection. Uh, you can use, of course, a CT scan to uh, identify the abscess. If you don't have a CT scan, uh, X-rays could be also useful, and you're looking for uh, an important length of soft tissues um, anterior to the cervical spine. Uh, and in this case, you can suspect um, an abscess. General anesthesia most of the time because they are children and uh, intraoral puncture or drainage for uh, pre and retrostelian abscesses. Uh, most of the time we just do puncture and of course antibiotherapy, uh, IV, uh, strong antibiotherapy, but not uh, drainage because uh, pre and retrostelian abscesses are very uh, close to uh, carotid artery and uh, jugular and uh, internal jugular vein. Uh, and most of the time, puncture is sufficient to have the microbiologic agent and to uh, help the healing with the antibiotic therapy. Another infection is uh, superative cervical lymphadenitis. It's also most of the time on children population, young children population. It's a complication of viral infection and it's a collected adenitis. Uh, when the collection is very, very small, you can just do uh, sometimes uh, under MEOPA, uh, it's uh, protoxid d'azote, uh, or when the, uh, there is a big collected adenitis, you must do it under general anesthesia, or surgical drainage. When you're doing a surgical drainage, you put a corrugated drainage sheet for uh, washes with 50% of uh, povidone iodine and 50% of uh, physiological serum. Just a few words uh, on uh, dental cellulitis. Could be maxillary. Generally, the drainage is under local anesthesia. Um, children is more complicated, but for adults, it's, uh, it's possible. And you put some gauze weak and of course, you treat the involved tooth. For mandibular uh, cellulitis, uh, it's more complicated because there is a risk of suffocation if the abscess is uh, on the floor of the mouth. So most of the time, the drainage is under general anesthesia. You treat also the involved tooth and you put corrugated drainage sheet for uh, washes daily washes after the surgery. Last but not least infection, the CV head and neck uh, cellulitis. It's a very severe infection, extra nodal. Uh, it could be nicotizing and it's uh, affecting the fascia. There is a very uh, fast uh, extension most of the time uh, and uh, it could be mediastinitis uh, associated. Most of the time, uh, it's on adult population presenting with a red neck, very stiff, very painful. Most of the time, it's an immunocompromised patient, for example, uh, HIV or with chemotherapy uh, or with kidney graft, uh, for example. You are examining the patient and uh, you're looking for snow weak reputation. When you find snow weak reputation, it could be the sign of necrosis. And most of the time it's anaerobic, anaerobic germs. And the management is quite uh, uh, heavy. It's a uh, very extensive cervicotomy surgery, removing or all, all infected or um, uh, necrotic uh, tissues. Most of the time, you do a tracheotomy uh, and, of course, corrugated uh, sheets for, uh, for drainage uh, several days after the surgery. So now you, we are going to see a few rhinological emergencies. Uh, there are fewer rhinological emergencies 
than uh, pharyngeal laryngeal emergencies uh, or even than otological emergencies. Uh, I think there is just three big rhinological emergencies, uh, which are foreign bodies, uh, bleeding, and infection. So first, very common foreign body. So this is uh, a little assortment of what uh, interns in our center can find in the nose of uh, patients, most of the time children. Uh, so we can see toys, uh, pearls, seeds, corns, Legos, a lot of Legos. And as for pharyngolaryngeal uh, foreign bodies, uh, when uh, this is a button battery, it's an emergency because of uh, chemical damage and uh, soft tissue uh, uh, necrosis. So the X-ray, it's a patient of mine with a young um, boy, I think five to six years old with a screw in the right nasal cavity. So to remove it, it's the same for uh, pharyngolaryngeal foreign bodies. It's all in the setup uh, because nose can be uh, inhaled and lead to asphyxia. So it is an emergency. I think it's a greater emergency then, uh, of course, here for in body, here for in body, uh, it's not an emergency to do uh, in the night if you are on duty or on call and uh, you, you have the uh, phone call at uh, 2 a.m. Uh, thought for in body it could be a little uh, more important to do it uh, fast, but uh, not for in body, it's an emergency because of the risk of uh, asphyxia. Uh, personally, I like to put the children, most of the time uh, it's the children, in, patient, in parents' homes, and I'm face-to-face -to, -face to the children with my, my microscope, but you can also do it with a headlight. Uh, for children, you can also restrain the children by sheet, and in our experience, generic anesthesia is very rarely needed for North foreign body. Instruments you use, uh, it could be blunt hook. I think it's a better instrument for most of the foreign bodies. Uh, you're going uh, up and uh, far uh, inside uh, to the foreign body. And then uh, you're bringing, bringing it uh, back uh, to the outside. You can also use Hartmann forceps for some foreign bodies. For example, coins, coins, Hartmann forceps are very good. Suction, if you have a pearl, um, or nasofibroscope in some cases when the foreign body is far, far away in the nasal cavity. And uh, nasofibroscope uh, can allow you to go behind the foreign body and uh, pull the foreign body out. Uh, I told you about uh, a technique. There is publication in ENT uh, journals, uh, but uh, we don't experiment this technique, so I don't know. It's called Moser's Kiss. Um, it's, uh, it's now to be a very good technique when you don't have uh, the instruments or uh, an ENT or uh, emergency doctor that knows how to take out foreign body. Uh, so Moser's kiss technique, you block the free nostril uh, of the child and the mother or the father, but a parent, kiss the child on the mouth and blow uh, softly, and when he feels uh, resistance, he blow harder. And generally, it's pulling off the uh, nose foreign body. There is a very small risk for young children of pneumothorax. So it's not uh, a riskless uh, technique. The complications uh, are the same. Uh, the foreign body can be pushed into the cavum and then swallowed. Most of the time, it's not a problem, except for button batteries, uh, or you can call you the gastroenterologist, and must be inhaled. And when it's inhaled, it could lead to asphyxia, especially for large foreign bodies, for example, uh, coins, Legos, uh, etc. The bleeding, when you're uh, taking back the foreign body, can be impressive, most of the time for the parents, uh, but most of the time, it's uh, always it's self-limiting. So don't worry about the bleeding. Talking about bleeding, we're going to see epistaxis. I think it's a quite common uh, emergency also. Uh, 
uh, a little bit of nasal vascularization first, which is very, very important in the nasal cavity. Uh, so it comes from internal carotid artery that lead to uh, ophthalmic artery and to both ethmoidal arteries, anterior and uh, posterior ethmoidal artery. So this is from the uh, internal carotid uh, system. And uh, external carotid artery um, leads to uh, internal maxillary artery and sphenopalatine artery. So nasal mucosa is highly uh, vascularized. There is first a very practical, very uh, practical medical management. Uh, think about yourself a little, protect yourself from broad splatters, because sometimes you don't know about uh, HIV status of the patient, for example. So protect yourself. And then um, before uh, going on the nose of the patient, you are looking for possible risk factors of epistaxis to be treated. No, for example, high blood pressure or hemostasis disorders, so low platelet, for example, uh, that could be treated. Then the patient is put in sitting position, the head slightly forward, never back, because back the patient is swallowing all uh, his blood, uh, and then it could lead to uh, vomiting. You need to count down the patient because the most the patient, uh, the most agitated the patient is, the more difficult the bleeding will be to control. You're asking yourself if um, it is a uni or bilateral bleeding, and if the bleeding is uh, principally anterior or antero posterior. You ask the patient to uh, blow his nose because clots um, eat up a lot of platelet. It makes a lot of platelet consumption. So the first thing is to make a good blowing of the clots. And then the principal gesture to do is digital compression with thumb and index on both nostrils like this for 10 minutes. It's very long, 10 minutes. So the patient sitting position, head forward, uh, after blowing his nose, digital compression, thumb and index, both nostrils, 10 minutes. And most of the time is sufficient for a simple epistaxis. If it's correctly done, digital compression, there is no way uh, the patient can have anterior bleeding. Okay, if the patient is doing a digital compression and is still bleeding uh, from the nose on the anterior side, uh, it's, it means that the digital compression is not done correctly. When it's insufficient uh, and there is still bleeding, we are talking about packing. And uh, for our experience, all nasal packs that are left more than 48 hours require uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. So for anterior nasal packing, uh, you need a little uh, uh, instruments. There is possible possibility of uh, putting non-absorbable uh, gauze uh, or nasal packs. Merocell, for example, from uh, Medtronic brand, uh, it's very simple. It could be done by nurse, uh, by a general practitioner. It's just behind the, the nose on the back, uh, but non-absorbable uh, nasal packing must be removed at two to three days. And sometimes when uh, it's removed, by the, the epistaxis is uh, coming back again. So it could be a little complicated. So we prefer absorbable uh, gelatin form or oxidized cellulose. In Toulouse, we use a uh, surgery cell, for example. Uh, it's better if the patient has uh, no bleeding disorders. And when correctly done by uh, an ENT or a doctor that knows a little uh, uh, nasal uh, anatomy, it's not a very painful procedure. So this is a video on a nasal, uh, anterior nasal packing. This is uh, done in the OR after septoplasty in the 10 years old children. You can see the nasal packing is very, very long and it's put back and not up, very back on the nasal cavity. It could be uh, inflate with saline, but when the patient is bleeding, generally just the, the blood uh, is sufficient. <laughs> 
When it's not sufficient, uh, the anterior nasal packing, uh, we're talking about anterior posterior nasal packing. Uh, so it is a more specific technique. There is a lot of brands uh, that are uh, doing double balloon devices, a lot of different double balloon devices. But if you don't have this kind of double balloon devices, you can do uh, an anterior posterior packing with a Foley catheter generally for an adult 10 to 14 French. With a 30 millimeters balloon, you put the Foley catheter on the nose, you take the Foley catheter back by the mouth, and then you inflate the balloon approximately with 10 milliliters of pure water, not saline because saline may crystallize. And then you apply a traction towards you uh, paying attention, preventing soft tissue damage. You can uh, um, do this with a traction with an umbilical clamp. And then you're also doing uh, with this posterior packing, an anterior packing, if possible, with absorbable uh, packing. And when the patient uh, is okay and has no more bleeding after a few uh, days, Generally, we uh, deflate the Foley catheter and we remove it very slowly, leaving the absorbable packing anterior, the uh, absorbable packing in the nasal cavity. Most of the time, uh, medical treatment is sufficient. When it's not sufficient, anterior or anterior posterior packing uh, is sufficient. And in the very severe cases, we can uh, do uh, surgery. So of course, if you have, uh, it's the same, if you have a neuroradiologist, uh, interventional neuroradiologist uh, on hand, it could be an option, but it's very difficult to, uh, to have it. So, uh, and embolization is just for a sphenopalatine artery, never uh, ethmoidal arteries, because ethmoidal arteries are a branch of ophthalmic artery. And if you perform an embolization on uh, ethmoidal artery, uh, there is a risk and not a small risk of uh, total blindness for the patient. So ethmoidal artery uh, ligation is done uh, in first intention surgery uh, when you are um, dealing with a post-traumatic epistaxis. You're doing a Lynch incision uh, along the lateral nasal dorsum. Uh, it can also be done uh, with lead crease approach, but uh, for, for aesthetic reason, but it's a little more uh, challenging. <clears throat> and then you're performing a superiostal uh, detachment until you reach the uh, anterior ethmoidal artery. So this is a small video with an, an endoscope. You don't necessarily need an endoscope, but with the endoscope, it's, uh, it's easiest, the easiest way to, to do it, but you can do also just uh, with a headlight. And when you find the anterior ethmoidal artery, you can cauterize it or you can clip it. Some very experimented rhinologist surgeons can perform an endoscopic ligation on the ethmoidal arteries anterior and anterior posterior uh, just by endoscopic way but it's way more challenging it's very uh, it's way more complicated this surgery it's quite simple uh, you must watch out for the orbital hematoma so we used to put a drainage sheet for a few days after the surgery uh, to avoid orbital hematoma So next, uh, the sphenopalatine artery ligation. Uh, so I told you the sphenopalatine can also be embolized uh, when, when you don't have an interventional radiologist with you. Uh, you do it for uh, endoscopic way. It's a quite difficult procedure because uh, usually there is bleeding in the nasal cavity. So uh, you must be... Uh, good surgeon with uh, endoscopy in the, in the rhinologist. Uh, it's performed for essential epistaxis most of the time. It's totally transcanal. Uh, you use an endoscope zero degree 
First, you're doing a vertical mucoperiostal incision on the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. Uh, and then you're uh, doing an elevation of a mucous flap. You can do a middle uh, meatal antrostomy. Uh, when you do it, it's more uh, easy. It's easier to, to find the sphenopalatine artery because when you are in the maxillary sinus, <clears throat> you can uh, check for the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus, and it is an anat anatomical marker for the uh, crystal etmoidalis. And just behind the crystal etmoidalis, you have the sphenopalatine artery. So here up, the middle meatus is here. The crystal etmoidalis is there. You can remove a little the crystal etmoidalis if it's too uh, prominent with a carison, for example to have a better exposure of the sphenopalatine artery. And then like for the etmoidal artery, you can uh, cauterize the spondyl artery, uh, the, the sphenopalatine art artery, or you can uh, clip it. So in this case, it's a cauterization which is done. And in, in this video, there is no bleeding. It's uh, more complicated in the real life with a patient uh, with a lot of bleeding. Okay, so last uh, rhinological emergency is uh, sinus infections. So it's very common. It's a very common uh, situation. Uh, like for epistaxis, there is a medical treatment for uncomplicated sinusitis. Very, very important is the local treatment. Uh, the local treatment, um, it is saline nasal irrigation, nasal decongestants, and sometimes when possible, nebulizer therapy with corticosteroids or adrenaline, for example. Uh, and this is usually the thing uh, general practitioner uh, forget, focusing on the uh, systemic treatment with antibiotic therapy and corticosteroids. But local treat treatment is very, very important um, for the drainage of the pus out of the sinus uh, involved. Complicated sinusitis. So the maxillary sinus is uh, rarely involved. Uh, sometimes the, the, the one emergency about the maxillary sinus is when the patient uh, presents uh, hyperalgesia. It is a sign of blocked sinus, and you can do uh, to relieve the pain an endoscopic middle meatotomy. Etmoid sinuses, most of the time it's on children because it's uh, the only one sinuses in children. Uh, and uh, it can lead to orbital abscess or neuromeningeal extension. Most of the time, the medical treatment is sufficient when the patient presents with, at the CT scan, an abscess. Uh, less than five millimeters and the patient doesn't have any ophthalmologic complications. Uh, most of the time by ophthalmologic complication, we're talking about uh, visual acuity loss because small diplopia is not a real complication. It's often due to edema and uh, with the medical treatment, it can evolve very well. Uh, so you see the little children on the, on the pictures below. Uh, it's at his first day admission and just after uh, medical treatment, a few days after, uh, it's uh, very, very uh, fine. Surgery is done when you have a big abscess in the orbital cavity, so more than five millimeters, or if you have any ophthalmologic complication, especially visual acuity loss. You can do it by external approach, like for etmoidal artery uh, ligation by lens uh, incision. Um, you can also go through transcaroncular way, uh, transcaroncular approach, but most of the time uh, it's more ophthalmologic surgeons that are used to this kind of surgery. <clears throat> 
You can do it with a fully endoscopic approach, but it's most of the time a little challenging because uh, it's a little children of uh, two or three years, small nasal cavity. It could be bleeding because it is a lot of infection. So in Toulouse, we used to do a combined approach, external approach to be sure we are uh, doing well on the abscess in the uh, orbital cavity and uh, an endoscopic approach. Next sinus uh, that can be involved is frontal sinus. Uh, the sinusitis could lead to neuromeningeal extension and on the CT scan you can see a frontal abscess and it can lead to a pot spuffy tumor which is an abscess uh, on the external side. And uh, you can see uh, the, this adult, uh, whole adult with a pot's beauty uh, tumor. In the both um, cases, uh, you must do uh, surgery. It could be done by endoscopic approach and eventually external surgery. You can put a uh, Lemoine nail to do some washes after the, after the surgery. And at least sphenoid sinus, when it's involved, it could lead to orbital abscess, cavernous sinus thrombosis, or neuromeningeal extension. And uh, the surgery is 100% uh, endoscopic. It's a sphenoidotomy, not a very, very complicated surgery. OK, last uh, type of emergencies we are going to see together. Uh, it's autological emergencies. It's uh, the last third of the presentation. It's a little easier for me uh, as I am principally an autologist surgeon in the Toulouse Hospital University Center. So like for uh, nose, like for throat, uh, you can find a lot of here foreign bodies. What kind of foreign bodies? So most of the time in the children's the same toys, pearls, seeds, corns, Lego, etc. But you can also find uh, insects in the ear canal. Uh, it's very, very, very rare to find insects in the nose or in the throat. But in the ear canal, there is a lot of insects we can find. The patient uh, present with uh, very painful uh, hair and it's very uncomfortable because the insect is doing a lot of noise. And when the insect feels trapped, it's scratching the skin of the ear canal, it's scratching the tympanic membrane, uh, and it's very, very uh, painful, very sensitive. Um, the first thing when you find an insect in the ear canal is to drown the insect. We use lidocaine because it's not autotoxic. Uh, I think it's more powerful on the insect than just water, and it's performing a local anesthesia, so it's good for the patient also. The removal, always the same thing, everything in the setup. Uh, we used to do it under a microscope, and I think it's better because uh, it's small, it's in the ear canal, but you can also do it with a headlight. The instruments, when it's possible, micro forceps are very useful. But uh, for example, for a pearl, you can't take out a pearl with a micro forceps. So we're using Rosen's micro hook that is put behind the foreign body to uh, take off the, the foreign body. Suction could be also interesting uh, in some cases. For children, uh, most of the time, it could be on parents' arms. Uh, the parent is uh, blocking the arms of the children. And the nurse, for example, takes uh, the head. But you also can restrain the child by a sheet. And in some cases, we are going on the uh, operating room on the general anesthesia. Uh, in our experience, uh, foreign bodies uh, of the ears are those for which general anesthesia is the most used uh, because we fear uh, hurting the, the patient and we fear the complications. Uh, we're going to see uh, if the, the child, for example, moves uh, too, too, too far. For adults, general anesthesia is rarely needed. Uh, at least we can do a local anesthesia auricular block 
We're going to see uh, how to perform it if needed. The complications of ear for and body could be a tympanic perforation. Of course, infection if the ear for and body is left a few days, a few weeks uh, in the ears. But by the removal, you can uh, have a tympanic perforation, you can have ossicular dislocation. And when the ossicular dislocation uh, involved the foot plate of the stapes, it can lead to a perilymphatic fistula. And perilymphatic fistula means total deafness and vertigo, which is a problem for the patient. So this is the way we are performing auricular block. Uh, under local anesthesia. Uh, we're using a 10 cc luer lock syringe with a um, uh, 25 gauge retro bulbar needle and with lidocaine plus adrenaline, 2% for adults, 1% for infants. In adults, maximum 20 cc is sufficient. We are doing uh, an anesthesia of the auriculotemporal nerve by ejecting at the level of the tragus and the helix. This is the first injection. And then we are uh, doing an anesthesia of the greater auricular nerve by injecting the retro auricular sulcus. It's not a good thing if you are uh, injecting too low on the retro auricular sulcus because you can cause uh, facial palsy, not permanent, of course but uh, facial palsy because you are too close to the uh, styloid mastoid foramen. And with this kind of anesthesia, uh, most of the time you can do any type of surgery involving the auricle, the external ear canal, the middle ear space. Uh, we are doing uh, autosclerosis, tympanic uh, perforation, even small cholesteatoma under just local anesthesia. Uh, when general anesthesia is complicated. So it's a very, very good way to do a surgery under local anesthesia. The next emergency uh, we're going to see uh, is ear canal trauma and uh, tympanic perforations. So for ear canal injury, it's very simple. You just need to make a small aspiration, uh, washes with uh, betadine or uh, with water, uh, sterile water. And if needed, you can put a little uh, pop, X, pop wicks uh, in the hairs and you put any auricular drops. You tell the patient not to put water until it's healed for a few days, one week. And it's very simple. When there is a tympanic perforation also, uh, if you can see the perforation, it's better if you can do a eversion of the edges of the perforation because if the perforation is inside the middle ear space, the healing could trap uh, some epidermic tissue in the middle ear space and lead to a cholesteatoma. The auricular drops are not autotoxic. So in France, there is just two types of auricular drops you can put on a tympanic perforation. It's ofloxacin, ofloset, uh, the brand, and rifamicin, otofa. But you don't put auricular drops with aminosid, for example. And if the patient complains about a fever, vertigo, uh, if he adds the signs of sensory neural hearing loss, uh, you need to perform a cochlear and vestibular assessment, but you can add corticosteroids or antibiotic therapy. Always the same, amoxicillin and uh, clavulanic acid. And of course, no water until you see the patient for the uh, adults, we see the patients at three months. For the child, we can see the patient several times, but we wait one year before uh, doing a tympanoplasty because the tympanic membrane can heal itself a very, very long time ago after the, the surgery, after the, the trauma uh, on children. So this is uh, an example of a tympanoplasty of mine for um, Q-tip trauma perforation. So some here infections uh, and complications. There is two type of uh, otitis, external otitis and um, otitis media. Uh, 
For external otitis, I think it is a very common uh, cause of consultation on the GP or in the ER. Uh, it's very frequent in hot and humid countries. So I assume in Myanmar, uh, it's quite frequent. And uh, for bacterial external otitis, the first symptom of which the patient uh, complains about is pain. It's very, very painful. And uh, the pain uh, is increased with the pressure of the tragus. So you tell the patients not to put water in the hair and you prescribe him uh, auricular drops. One week treatment is sufficient. And for uh, very severe cases, like in the otoscopy, uh, you can uh, propose uh, uh, pop hair wicks for the stenosis. And the pop hair is removed at two to three days. And generally at two uh, or three days with a pop wick and auricular drops, you can see the tympanic membrane. The other type of external otitis is fungal otitis. Uh, in this case, the first symptom of which the patient is complaining about is pruritus. So it's the same, eh? no water, but specific auricular drops must be prescribed. In France, there is just one type of auricular drops called auricularum uh, with uh, antifungal uh, agents. It's one month treatment, fungal otitis, uh, it's longer to heal. And if possible, you see the patient weekly for microscopic aspiration because intra-cavity cleaning is very important for fungal otitis. I must tell a word about a very severe complication of uh, external otitis. It's the necrotizing, also called malignant, otitis externa, most of the time it's for uh, fragile patients, uh, most of the time diabetic or immunocompromised patients, also very old patients. And it, the patient presents with a chronic external otitis. And when you are doing the uh, otoscopy, you can see a hair canal polyp. When you see a polyp in the hair canal, it's a sign of oste osteitis. So when there is a polyp, it could be a cancer. So, so sometimes you must perform a biopsy. But when it's infectious, uh, it means that the infection has, has reached the bone. You can also find polyp in cholesteatoma because cholesteatoma uh, make bone lysis. So it means when you have this kind of polyp uh, with uh, an external otitis on a fragile patient that you have skull, bars, skull base osteitis. And uh, this can lead to severe complications, for example, lateral sinus thrombosis, MPMA, cerebral abscess, cranial nerve, especially facial nerve palsy, etc. The treatment is not the same. It's not just uh, some auricular drops. It's an IV antibiotherapy for a very long time, most of the time, at least six weeks, and sometimes 10, 12 weeks, and for very severe cases, surgical debridement. The other type of otitis is acute otitis media. Uh, so it's rather child, but it can occur on adults uh, with nasopharyngitis. And it's treated by oral antibiotherapy and saline nasal irrigation. Uh, for the complications, uh, which are many in the acute otitis media, you must think anatomical. The Middle East space, uh, you can compare it to a cube, and there is uh, eight faces. So the external faces, uh, face is the eardrum and could lead to eardrum perforation. It's not a real complication because uh, generally it helps the healing of the uh, otitis media. If the pus, if the infection is going on the posterior uh, face of the cube, uh, it's leading to mastoiditis. If it's going to the superior face of the cube, it's leading to uh, neuromeningeal complications, so meningitis and PMA, abscesses. If it's going to the internal face of the cube, uh, it can lead to uh, labyrinthitis uh, going through the inner here or facial palsy because the uh, facial nerve uh, 
uh, could be uh, day sent on the uh, middle ear space. Um, generally, it's just temporary, but it could you could have a facial palsy because of an acute otitis media. If it's going through the inferior face of the cube, uh, it can lead to lateral sinus thrombosis, and it's going below, it could lead to basal abscess. We're going to see some example. In every case of a complication, you must perform a parasynthesis for bacteriological sample and for the treatment for the pus evacuation. So it's a video, not a video from Toulouse, but you see the child uh, must be restrained. I think it's a good way for also foreign bodies. And you can perform, we do under a microscope, but if you have this kind of otoscope with an operator channel, you're doing a little puncture in the inferior and or inferior and anterior side of the tympanic membrane, never posterior and superior posterior side, because in the superior posterior side of the tympanic membrane, you have the ossicles and you could do an ossicular disruption. To make the puncture, to treat the otitis media, and to sample uh, examination for identifying the microbiologic agent. This is an example of uh, acute mastoiditis. So it starts generally with a redness on the retro auricular sulcus. Uh, and in this case, you're looking for acute otitis media, you're performing a parasynthesis, and sometimes you could do just a puncture on the redness uh, to look for very small abscess, periosteal abscess. If it's evolving, it can lead to a collection. And when you are looking at the child from the front, you can see uh, one hair is sticking out uh, a lot uh, sticking out in particular. You're doing a CT scan with injection because you're looking for intracranial complication. And in this case, uh, this child has very large periosteal abscess behind the ear, but also uh, lateral sinus thrombosis. So this is an indication for a mastoidectomy in emergency. Results abscess are quite uh, rare. Uh, it's when the infection goes uh, down into deep cervical spaces, and it can, um, it's a rarer complication. Uh, it can extend in the cervical uh, posterior spaces. So this is uh, accessible to cervicotomy, and it can go to uh, parapharyngeal and retropharyngeal spaces. So when you need to uh, make an operation on the, this kind of patient, it's a combined approach, intraoral and by cervicotomy. And I think it's the last of the autological emergencies, uh, temporal bone fractures. So a little bit of anatomy first, it is a real temporal bone taken from a corpse in the anatomy laboratory. Um, all the soft tissues are removed. It is a left temporal bone. So this is the zygomatic arch. It helps to define the side of the temporal bone. Uh, this is the squamous part of the temporal bone. This is a petrous bone, the tympanic, uh, tympanal bone, sorry, uh, which is closing the uh, external auditory canal on the anterior and inferior side, and the external ear canal. So the, the petrous bone is like a pyramid, a four faces pyramid. So the base of the pyramid is external, but when you look at the intracranial part of Petrus bone, uh, you have two faces looking up intracranial, the posterior faces uh, up on the cerebellum, the anterior faces up to the uh, temporal lobe, and two faces looking uh, on uh, profound cervical spaces. And this is the internal auditory canal, 
uh, with the facial nerve and cochleovestibular nerve. Below, you see the facial nerve, which is out uh, on the mastoid foram, um, stylomastoid foramen, and the two big vessels, internal jugular vein and internal carotid artery. Temporal bone fractures. Um, Temporal bone is one of the thickest bone of the entire body. So to be fractured, it must be a very, very severe uh, high kinetic trauma. For example, public road accident or defenestration or violent beating. Uh, first, this is a clinical assessment. You're looking for ear bleeding or hemotympanum. It's treated by uh, drops, no, no problem. You're looking for vertigo and especially an nystagmus opposite to the fracture. It is a bad sign. Generally, it means that the inner ear is, uh, is touched. You're looking for hearing loss, and hearing loss could be a little complicated because uh, you, can't very be, you can be sure if it is conductive or sensory neural hearing loss. So generally, I uh, advise my advice is to use a turning fork if you don't have an audiometry. A turning fork, you're doing a Weber test. And if the patient lateralizes the vibration of the turning fork on the healthy side, it's a good uh, sign of sensory neural hearing loss. If the patient lateralizes the vibration of the turning fork to the affected side, it's a good sign. It's a sign of conductive hearing loss. Um, you're looking for facial palsy, grading one. It means no facial palsy to six. It means complete facial palsy on the house grading. And the very important fact is uh, the onset latency. If the facial palsy is immediate, usually it means that the fracture is going through the facial nerve. If the facial palsy is delayed a few hours or a few days after the trauma, it means that it's uh, just uh, edema. And usually in this case, corticosteroids are sufficient. And at least you're looking for osteomeningal bridge. Uh, osteomeningal bridge uh, could be uh, seen with a patient with otolicorrhea when there is a tympanic perforation, or CSF rhinorrhea when there is no tympanic perforation. The CT scan is very important for the uh, assessment of the lesions. And the management is medical, first auricular drops, corticosteroid therapy. Antibiotic therapy is not uh, mandatory. And if the patients have a lot of vertigo, you can do vestibular re-education for BPPV, for example, or because he has a, a very severe deficit. You must know and you must tell the patient that he has an increased risk of meningitis. And in some rare cases, you need to perform uh, otology lateral skull based surgery for osteomeningal breach, for example, but it's not an emergency, uh, an immediate emergency. Usually, uh, the osteomeningal breach heals itself in a few days, but when the patient has uh, otolicorrhea or CSF rhinorrhea after a few days, a few weeks uh, after the, uh, the trauma, you must uh, make this surgery to close this osteomeningal bridge. And it could be done by a transmastoid approach or by middle fossa approach. Um, more uh, urgent surgeries are for people with perilymphatic fistula. Uh, perilymphatic fistula, it's when you have still hearing and when the patient complains about um, violent vertigo, but not all the time. Uh, most of the time, it's when the patient blow his nose, do a valsalva maneuver, for example. And of course, you must do a surgery when the patient uh, has uh, an immediate, complete facial palsy. That means there is a facial injury and the CT scan can confirm it. So it's just two <coughs> little uh, video from the service to end this presentation. Uh, the first one 
is a fashion nerve decompression. It's the right side. We are performing a mastoidectomy under a microscope and the patient has um, the fracture going through the third portion of the uh, fascial nerve. We can see here the fracture. So the surgery uh, is to remove all bones uh, which are hurting the facial nerve to help facial nerve uh, heal. Of course, the patient also uh, need the medical treatment, corticosteroids, and a patient has a facial re-education for a few weeks or a few months after the surgery. And the last video is uh, a case of perilymphatic fistula. So this is the uh, um, left side. You have the um, stapes, and you can see that there is a liquid going uh, out through the foot plate of the stapes. It is perilymphatic liquid. And the surgery is uh, transcanal. It's quite simple. It's just to put uh, autologous fat taken from behind the ear of the patient to close the perilymphatic fistula. So uh, as a take-home message, I should say that uh, ENT emergency could be, uh, there is a lot of ENT emergencies. Uh, it's a very uh, common, there are very common conditions in the uh, ER. Uh, some are uh, quite frequent and behind, uh, but some are very uh, rare and severe. For head and neck, uh, there is sometimes extreme respiratory emergency or extreme uh, hemorrhagic emergency. And most of the time, the nasofibroscope or uh, direct laryngoscope assessment is, um, is useful. For rhinologic emergencies, uh, principally, um, it is infectious or hemorrhagic emergencies, and the use of endoscope would be very helpful. And for autological uh, emergencies, it's rarely vital, but it could be very important for the function of the patient, the earring, the equilibrium, uh, the facial uh, nerve, and the microscope is very important for this kind of emergencies. First, the physical examination is uh, very important, but sometimes imaging could be uh, very helpful, and most of the time it's CT scan. Uh, it's not echography, it's not MRI, CT scan is uh, often useful. And when you need surgical management, it could be very simple for some cases, for example, foreign bodies or things like this, to a very expert management for complicated uh, endoscopic rhinologic uh, surgeries or autological uh, surgeries. So I thank you for your attention. Uh, I wish you all the best. This is my mail. If uh, some of you have uh, questions, and I think there is questions in the, in the chat, and I, I'll try to help you my best. Thank you. Thank you very much. So questions. Now, a lot of questions you, you can Hello. So, I so too many questions, I think. <laughs> yes, yes. They, they will read the, the, the question and, and after that you can answer. So okay. you, you, your screen, you, you can remove your presentation. Yes. Uh, up. 